So welcome to this tutorial which is going to look at height field scattering in Houdini. This is a subject that's been covered in a couple of other tutorials but I must admit that I remained a little confused about how it works uh, after seeing those so uh, this is just a description of, of how I came to understand height field scattering. So I've got a very simple scene here. Um, I've basically got uh, some sets of geometry, uh, three types of house, three types of tree, and three types of rock. And I've got a very basic height field, the start of a very basic height field here, which we're going to scatter uh, those houses and trees onto. So you can see the height field is not particularly realistic, it's just this sort of stepped shape. Um, the masking that I've already put in here is actually just a mask by feature, which is detecting the flat areas of the terrain. And that's where we're going to scatter our houses, which will tend to be on the flat areas. Now, in fact, the way scattering works means that it's advantageous to shrink these uh, masks a little bit, because if you have uh, houses scattered on the edge here, then they can go into the, the sloping area, which we don't want. So we can have a height field mask shrink node, like so. Uh, and by default, it's going to shrink it too much. So let's go down to two and maybe put it at about four. And you can see that's now shrinking away from the sloping edges here, but it's not shrinking from the borders of the uh, of the height field and that's because we've got the override border set to streak and what we want is set it to constant and a border value of zero and that will give us what we want. So let's lay down a height field scatter. And have a look at the inputs to start with. So there are three inputs. There's the terrain, that's uh, the first input. Then there's a mask or scatter points, and in this case, it's going to be the mask that's coming in here. And then the third input are going to be the objects that we're going to scatter. And to start with, I'm going to scatter from these houses that I've got set up here. And let's just talk a little bit about these houses. So let's look at this one. So I've got a house. Uh, it's modelled so that it sits on the XZ plane, and that's important so that it doesn't sink into the terrain. And then we're creating two attributes on this house, one of which is called class, uh, and the other is called weight. So the class is what's going to be used by the scatter to distinguish between the different types of house. So in this case, uh, the class here has a value of zero, the class on the next version of the house has a value of 1, and the final version of the house has a value of 2. And then the next uh, attribute is weight. And weight is an attribute which tells the scattering algorithm how many of each type of house or whatever object it is that you're scattering how many of each type to scatter. So in this case, I've got the weight on all of them set to the same. So 0 0.333, 0 0.3333, and 0 0.333. So that's going to be a third each. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be uh, scattered evenly. But if you wanted more of house one, you could increase this value. And then finally, I've added some colors here. Those are actually not going to show up in the render. They're just to allow me to see quickly uh, which variants of the house are being placed. So let's connect this up and have a look at what our height field scatter is going to do by default. Uh, and by default uh, we're not getting very much that's interesting. So let's go through the parameters here and have a look at uh, what they what they do. I'll just maybe enlarge this a little bit. So the first parameter up here is a parameter which is going to define a name for the things that are being scattered because what will happen is that the scatter is either going to scatter points and later on you're going to instance geometry to those points or you're going to scatter packed primitives and then render the packed primitives later on 
and in either case what you want to have is a name associated with those uh, points so I'm going to call this houses and this scatter method we're going to use a couple of different uh, scatter methods here but I'm going to use the total point count using mask layer and that is going to give me these parameters here this is the number of instances there are going to be and this uh, tells you how big the instances are going to be and in my case I'm going to have a, a really small point count and leave it at that so I've got now five instances of a house being put onto my masked area uh, which is good because each of these houses is going to be the center of a, of a sort of village and I can play about with the distribution here by changing the global seed so we can as you see as we change the global seed the sizes and the types of house are changing now the way that it knows which pieces uh, are different houses is given by this define pieces parameter here and at the moment it's set to from connectivity so it's just having a look at everything that's coming in here it's all merged together it's finding the pieces that are separate 3d objects and it's using them as the separate houses in fact we've set up this class attribute so we're going to change this to from attribute and set it to class and uh, now uh, we can see hopefully when we go into the geometry spreadsheet well let me first of all middle click here to show you what we have uh, perhaps you can't uh, try showing the node information uh, what we can see is that we've got seven points and five packed geos so in fact the the seven points two of those are to do with the height field there the mask and the height uh, the five packed geos are these houses that we can see displayed here and if we have a look at our geometry spreadsheet and have a look at the points uh, we can see that we've got a number of parameters that are set out here including a tag parameter and the tag parameter is the thing that we set up here when we set this name to houses and then we've got the UV coordinates of the place where it's scattered and then we've got this thing called variant and the variant is the class number of the instance uh, that we've got uh, being placed in that particular location and later on when I come to talk about instancing um, which you may need to use for renderers other than Mantra for example for Octane if you want an efficient render then this variant parameter comes in very useful so if we have a look at our houses uh, we can see that they're all rather straight I mean they're not they're not rotated at all and the reason for that is that we haven't set a variation here so there's a set of controls here which allow you to randomize the up direction and to randomize the yaw in other words how much rotation there will be so I'm going to give that a value of 180 which is going to allow the, the buildings to be at almost any angle and this is, is randomized as you can see now the control here instance on new points determines what is happening at the moment with this selected what we're getting as I showed you earlier is packed geometry uh, which is representing the houses if we turn this off uh, we're just going to get points and the disadvantage of that in the current implementation of height field scatter and I'm not sure why this is the case is you lose uh, the variant attribute you no longer have a variant attribute uh, and that means you can't instance later on and have it choose which variant you're, you're going to instance so now I want to add some more houses clustering around let me just swap this back to instanting on new points some more houses clustering around each of these houses and for this I need another height field scatter and in this case I'm gonna add this again so that this points into the second uh, input 
and the third input I'm going to have the houses again right and let's just adjust how this is going to work so one of the uh, and we'll call this houses 2 let's say for the surrounding houses you can call it anything you like and the method of scattering this time is per point count using source points what this is going to do is take a set of incoming points that's the houses that we already scattered and then scatter some more houses in this case around them so let me choose that and the source point tag is houses and the range I think uh, four to six maybe that's okay and then uh, let me change this we need to get these so that they're not pushed up onto the slopes here so this range parameter is telling you how many new houses are going to be instanced around uh, the original house and the positioning method the one I actually want is origin so the incoming points are going to be the sort of center of each of these clusters of houses and then uh, the radius I'm going to vary between 0 and 6 and we need to increase this radius to about 2 I happen to know so that we get the buildings so the buildings don't overlap and that of course will depend a bit on the size of your your geometry so the relax points uh, section of the of the parameters here you can control this to, to work out how efficient it is how how thorough it is at ensuring your points don't overlap uh, I I in fact have not found that you need to change that much and again we're going to randomize the the rotation so now we've got uh, a set of of variants in each of our villages there and that looks that looks pretty good that one is just on the side of the slope but I think it's okay so yep I think we can go with this so the next thing I want to do is to scatter some trees and I want the trees to be in the places where the houses are not uh, and in fact I've noticed here we've got we've got some unfortunate things here with the houses hanging over the edge uh, I'm not going to bother to fix that now but uh, by playing about with the radius parameters and the seed you can usually make sure that this doesn't hang out over the edge but for the moment we'll ignore it uh, the way that you can scatter trees in the places where the houses are not is by creating a mask uh, which excludes the areas where the houses are and we start by creating a mask which actually surrounds the houses because there is a node called uh, mask by object and that's what we're going to use so uh, the first thing we need to do is just make sure that we've just got the houses and nothing else so I'm going to use a, a blast node and I know that the points and the pack geos which have the houses have one of two tag attributes remember we had uh, tag attributes here uh, on the points and the tag attributes are either houses 2 or houses so if I set up a blast and I use the syntax for attributes so I go at tag equals houses and at tag equals houses 2 and I delete non-selected uh, what I should find where are we ah and I make sure that I'm deleting points uh, then we should find that we're just getting the houses left and then uh, this uh, node here takes a terrain so we're going to go back to oh, whoops going to go to our terrain here and the second input are the things that we're going to mask so if I now select this uh, we're replacing the mask and we're projecting and you could just about see that underneath there there is a mask but it's it's very small so we're going to need to expand it and unfortunately there is a mask expand node like so 
uh, and that will spread the mask out. Uh, in this case it's far too large. Let's try something like 4 or even 3 or even 2. Maybe 2. So there are two problems uh, with uh, the mask at the moment. The one is that it's masking the areas round the houses, whereas we want to uh, mask the areas which are not round the houses. And the second is it's a bit square on the outside. You can see it has this square shape. So let's deal with that shape issue first. And we can use a height field distort by noise. And we can distort the mask like so. And we need to take the amplitude down. And as you can see, this is uh, distorting the shape of the mask. Let me just uh, change the element size, maybe make it a... Yeah, that looks pretty good. I think that'll do okay. Yeah. So that's giving it a bit more of an interesting shape and the, making sure the trees are not going to be too regular around the around the villages. And the next thing I need to do is, is do a height field uh, remap and the height field remap again we need to make sure we're working on the mask layer uh, we've got an input range 0 to 1 and an output range and simply by reversing the output range I can reverse the mask and so we get an area here which is where we want to put the trees but before I scatter the trees, I actually want to adjust this mask. And what I want to do is to create some roads which are connecting the villages where we won't have trees. So let's do that. And we can... It's not working. Uh, let me have a look this way. So we can use a height field paint node. And again, we're going to put it on the mask. And we can have a foreground value of 0 and a background value of 1. See how big our brush is. Far too big. Radius 5, let's say. Yeah, that's a bit more like it. And now what should happen is if I paint on here, we should get a road. And then I can paint like that and get another road and I paint like that and we get another road and I can add strokes here to give it a bit, bit more width for example so that's going to be controlling where the trees are scattered and it helps me to make sure that I have something that looks reasonably realistic so I'm now ready to uh, put down another height field scatter like so Let's enlarge this. So in this case, uh, we want our trees to be the input. The trees are over here. They're going to be the third input. We want our painted mask to be the second input. And we want our terrain uh, that we were using earlier on as our third input. And what we're going to do is use a different, let's call this trees by the way, we're going to use a different method. Uh, before we used first of all total point count using mask layer that gave us just five initial houses. We then used per point count using source points to surround those initial houses with further houses. This time we're going to use by coverage and mask layer and I seem to remember that the defaults work reasonably well. Let's So what's happened here? There's some kind of error. Nope, there's no error. Right, let's go and see. Right, actually you can you can see that's worked out pretty well. We've got a couple of problems here. Trees here are, as you can see, not realistic. They're, they're sort of pointing along the normal direction rather than straight up. And that's very easy to fix because there's a parameter here uh, which says match direction with slope. And if we, sorry, match normals with terrain. And if we turn that off, uh, the trees all start to point upwards, which is probably what you want. 
Uh, in this case, uh, we want to randomize our yaw again, rotation. And I think we can give a little bit, uh, maybe 10%, no, that's too much, 3% uh, of varying uh, of the normal direction. So that we get a little tiny bit of variation like that. So we can see that's starting to look pretty realistic now, actually. Pretty good. Um, we're not getting any overlap between... Ah, I seem to have failed to join the final village up with a with a path. Never mind. Uh, you can see the concept. So, uh, the... Let me just check here that we've got these uh, set up correctly. So, this here is what tells you how far apart these things are going to be scattered. This tells you the variation in size, so if I were to do a big variation in size you can see some of them will be enormous, but we don't want that. So the defaults here are, seems to be working pretty well. This section, as I said, uh, prevents the trees from overlapping each other. This section controls the normal direction and so on and allows you to randomize the uh, the the rotation. And again, actually, we want to have this um, from attribute. We want to use the class attribute. Um, and that's uh, because we got the class attribute set up here. Seems to be giving me a strange result there. Let me just investigate why it's uh, giving me one kind of tree. Okay, well, the answer as to why that wasn't working was because I'd set up my class attribute wrong. So there were two things wrong with it. Uh, one of which was that it was a float instead of an integer, and it wasn't a primitive attribute, it was a point attribute. So I fixed uh, both of those things so that now uh, this is producing uh, a correct distribution. So the final component that I'm going to add to the scene are some rocks. So let me um, add another height field scatter, bring in the terrain, bring in the mask, and then a second we seem to be getting the wrong mask there. It needs to come from the paint node. Let's put that back there. Uh, that's interesting that that is that's the correct mask. Well, uh, at the moment it's displ displaying the wrong mask for some reason. We're going to connect uh, the geometry to be scattered to a set of rocks that I prepared earlier, like so. And uh, in this case I don't have a class attribute, I'm just using uh, the weight. And we're going to scatter using the mask and let's call this rocks and we're going to use by coverage using mask layer or no let's let's do by density using mask layer and then we need to up the density like so that's pretty good okay and we can see we've got different types of rock being instantiated, instantiated there. And I'm going to change this so that they're a random rotation, like so. And that seems to work pretty well. They're not overlapping with the trees, and they're not overlapping with the houses. So they're not overlapping with the houses because we've got a mask um, there. And they're not overlapping with the trees uh, because we've got this relaxation option here, avoid point tag set to star. So that's avoiding the trees. We could just type in trees here and we would see that uh, it doesn't change things very much. It's still avoiding the houses because of the mask. So that's our final uh, set of not avoiding the trees terribly well there. Uh, have I misnamed that? The scatter of trees was called... Tr 
trees, so that should work. Um, maybe I need to change the fall off to zero. Yeah, that's helped. Okay. Uh, the reason was that I had a fall off, which meant that this, the the uh, scattering was not uh, taking account of the full size of the tree. And that seems to be all right. Yeah, good. All right, well, the final thing we can do is to delete the mask layer. And I can do that using a layer clear, like so. And then just clear the mask set it to a value of zero like so the thing i should say by the way is some of this geometry we set a class attribute to distinguish the different pieces of geometry some of the geometry in particular the rocks uh, what we've done is used this from connectivity which allows the node to work out automatically which bits of geometry are are separate from which. Uh, it, even when you use this uh, from geometry, uh, you get a variant number. So uh, you can see here we've got the rocks tag and we get a variant number even though this uh, this node does not have a class attribute defined. So that's basically how the, the height field scatter works. I wanted to add a little bit extra to talk about how this can be used in a renderer that is not Mantra, a renderer that does not accept packed primitives. Uh, how can you render it efficiently? Um, well, in Octane, you can render you, if you you can render packed primitives, but it's not very efficient. It, it simply unpacks the primitives and then renders them, or at least that's the current version. The way that it does instancing is to use the instance node. So I wanted just to illustrate very quickly how you can use instancing to uh, take what you've generated here and use it for, for a renderer like Octane. So you'll have noticed um, that the scene has changed here and that's because I've loaded up a scene that I prepared earlier uh, and already has the instancing set up. So let me have a look at this. Let's enlarge this. So the first thing you would need to do to use Octane to render this efficiently, uh, you can you can just render this, but it uh, the, the the pack geo is on this, uh, but it wouldn't be very efficient. Uh, for a scene of this size, it probably wouldn't make much of a difference. Uh, you could you could use this amount of geometry; it wouldn't be a problem. But for uh, this, uh, if, if you had a very, very big scene with many, many trees and so on, then you would want to use instancing. So all I've done here is, is for each uh, type of geometry, I'm bringing in a, a file node and just loading it into the scene. And then I've got instance nodes for each of the different types. Tree instance, rock instance, house instance, and so on. So let's dive inside one of these and see how it works. So in this case, I'm bringing in the results of that scattering that we did. I'm blasting away everything that isn't a house. And remember, the houses have a tag of either house. Well, in this scene, I used house and house two. In the video I just showed, it was houses and houses two, but it's the same. So this is just going to give us the points with houses on. And if we middle click here, we can see that we've got 24 packed geos, so we've got 24 houses. Uh, and then we need to deal with the variant. So there are three variants, and I'm going to delete everything that doesn't have a variant of zero. And then I need to do something uh, to cope with the fact that what we're using here are the packed geometry points. And this is unfortunate, but the packed geometry points are positioned at the center of the at the centroid of, of the thing that, that is packed. Whereas our houses were designed to rest 
on the ground plane. Uh, so if I didn't have this adjustment here, uh, what we would find is our houses would be floating up above the ground. So we need to set the Y position of our instancing point from an attribute which is helpfully stored on those points, which is called height, and that simply records the height of the height field at the place where the instance is being instanced. So all this does is it sets our Y coordinate for these points to the height, and then this add node is simply deleting the geometry and keeping the points. Uh, remember this is packed geos we're dealing with. In fact, if you feed the packed geos in to Octane, then it appears to instance on every point of the packed geo. So this just cleans it up so that we just have points. And the points have various uh, things that determine how the, uh, how the, the instance will be rendered. For example, it's got an orient attribute, that's the thing that's going to give it the rotation. It's got a P scale, which is going to vary the size. Uh, and it's got a UV attribute. You could use that perhaps to uh, change the color of the, of the instances. I haven't seen how that would work in Octane. So essentially we're doing exactly the same thing for the houses, for the trees, and for the rocks. And of course also we need to convert our height field into polygon so that it can render in Octane. Uh, so let me come out of this and let's just have a look through our camera and then let's uh, render this in, in Octane if we can get there. So I've already set up, I should say, also um, some very basic uh, materials, added them to the houses, a render target, something that's shading the ground, and so on. Uh, and so it should be the case that if I click IPR, uh, this is going to render. So let me do that. And it's going to take a moment because it hasn't uh, rendered this scene before. So uh, perhaps I'll just pause the video while this is happening. Oh no, there it is. Okay, and we can see that we're getting pretty much what we expect, a nice high quality render from Octane. This is a very cartoony type of scene, but I hope you can see how you could use it to create sophisticated landscapes and render them in Octane. Thanks very much. I hope it's been useful.